Praise you, my God. Praise you, my King. We exalt you, Lord God. Now be in our midst. Be Emmanuel, God, with us. For we ask it in the name above all names, Jesus, the Messiah, the Anointed One. Amen and amen. You may be seated. This is our week of prayer. You were handed prayer requests on your way in. Here's one prayer for my daughter, daughter Rebecca, who is homeless for three years and may be on drugs. Pray for my diabetes is removed and the pain in my hips goes away. My son-in-law Dave has had a stroke at age 73. In the last report, he's not doing good. Pray for my cousin who found out he has lung cancer. Pray for healing from my hip problems, arthritis throughout my body, and pray for my wayward grandson that he would come back to the Lord. Let's just lift these to the Lord. Lord God Almighty, you are the God who answers prayer. You are the God who comes down from heaven and walks with us. For in you, we live and move and have our being. So Lord, we come with these prayer requests. We come with the things that we cannot do, things that medical science cannot do, things that to our eyes seem impossible. But with you, all things are possible. You work miracles. And so we believe in you. We believe in the one that you sent. So Lord, stretch forth your hand to do miracles. Move in these lives, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight we kick off Rosh Hashanah and on this very stage against all my Baptist upbringing, we are going to dance <laughs> and celebrate. And we're going to have Paul Wilbur. And for those of you that don't know, he has a new CD, Forever Good, which has been somewhat on constant play on my iPod as I commute to and from work, which has been great. So I've been having these wonderful worship times. Uh, and you can join in with Adonai Elohai and call on the name and some other really good ones. So new music from Paul and a new book from Paul, A King is Coming. Uh, and these are going to be available in the lobby tonight. So there's an extra special reason to come tonight to Rosh Hashanah. And as, I guess, wayward Protestants, we need to understand that God has appointed times. And we sometimes get away from the calendar of God. Tonight, let's celebrate the calendar of God, the start of the new year the time of blowing, the blowing of the shofar, where we look forward to the day where there, there's, there's, there's this king who's going to come and a shofar is going to blow from the mountain of the Lord and the whole earth is going to hear it and see it and we're going to celebrate and anticipate that he's coming. And I'm going to get off the stage and let Paul talk. So Paul, come with me. All right, wow, wonderful. Uh, I asked my friend Chris Springer if he would join me. Chris um, produced one of my early Integrity projects. Chris has been with Integrity Music for uh, several millennia, I think. <laughs> uh, but, but every, every, no, I won't say that. There, there's a season for everything. And uh, neither of us are any longer with integrity, but he has a wonderful anointing. I asked if he would come and, and just kind of uh, let the anointing flow. Great to be with you today. Uh, I count it a real privilege to stand in front of you 
Um, I believe God has appointed us for such a time as this. As I travel, a lot of people are asking, what's up? Um, I happen to be a Jewish believer, so people expect that I have a, a special hotline, a red phone at my bedside, or it's just not true. There, there's... Um, There's something that happens for each of us when we come into the understanding to that place where God has prepared for us. I'm, I'm moved by the season that God has given to us because I truly believe these are the last of the last days. And with that, with the knowledge, with what God has invested in us, there also comes a great responsibility. And that's the other side of welcome to the kingdom. You know, after you get beyond your Baptist theology and you actually dance before the Lord and... enjoy the, the freedom and, and get to enjoy your emotions in a, in a godly way, um, there, there comes a responsibility. Uh, Gordon and I were talking on the, the show this morning. The Lord said something to me very profound. I, I want to bring you some fresh bread today. I'm not looking to deliver you know, one of my 174 messages that I pull out of my briefcase and say, well, that fits. But I've been praying and asking the Lord that, you know, he's always, he's always baking something. He's, he's a master chef. He's always cooking something. And, and I've asked him today that, that he take something fresh out of the oven and serve it up to us. I, I'm not going to say I don't know about you because I know that you're here because you're looking to stir something up inside of you. You're here because you want the investment that God has placed in you to be used. You, you want, should he tarry, you want the world to know that, that you were here, not because of who you are, but because of who he is in you. Am, am I right? Am, is that right? Okay. So I was, I was right in the middle of a, a beautiful worship song when the Holy Spirit spoke to me and interrupted all of that beautiful stuff going on, and he said, no more declarations without demonstrations. No more declarations without demonstrations. What did Jesus say to the Pharisees? He said, if you don't believe me for what I'm saying, then at least believe me for the works that I do. Three nights ago, I was in San Jose, Costa Rica, Pura Vida, for those of you who know. Costa Rica has been discovered by surfer, American surfers and vacationers, beautiful country. And I was, I was really wrung out. I mean, we'd flown in the day before, set up, sound check, whole, whole team, and then the day of and, and the way it goes with all of that. And then the, there was no air conditioning in the building. It was packed out. People were standing on top of other people. And, and I love that, of course. But in, in that heat and all, in 10 minutes, I'd soaked through all of my clothes. And by the end of the evening, I don't know, 10.30 at night or 11, no supper. I was really wrung out. I was escorted back to my green room where there was no air conditioning, uh, but there were Cheetos, and <laughs> so I was okay. And, and as I was there trying to refresh, knock came on the door, and my, my friend, Andy Bussey, who travels with me and does our tech and production and all, he said, there's a line forming outside, so gird up your loins. And... Um, and I, I had to work through a little bit of, okay, Lord, I'd really like to go back to my air-conditioned hotel and just chill. But the first 
people through the door was a, a woman who was the director of the Israeli embassy. And I thought, okay, well, this, this could be good. <laughs> and next to her, she brought in with her a young mother with a 12-year-old who would not let go of his mom. And the Israeli embassy lady said, um, we were here three years ago, not here, but I, it was a much bigger place, an arena, I think a baseball stadium. 13, 14, 15,000 people showed up. And uh, she said, you, you need to hear this. Now this is Israeli embassy woman bringing a testimony of what she had seen three years before. And this mother with very broken English and through an interpreter with water leaking out her face, she said, three years ago, you prayed for my son who had been plagued with multiple epileptic seizures every day of his life. And she said, from that night until today, he hasn't had one seizure. And so, first of all, it's, it's good to dance and get your clothes soaked in the Lord. Even if you're Presbyterian, it works. <laughs> Not sure about Episcopals, but we'll, we'll leave that. But we've been given such a privilege, such an honor. And can we believe God enough to get beyond what I need and how I feel and what I think? Can we, can we get that beyond that too? How do you feel? What do you say? What do you think? Because as I see it, I really believe that this is the source of the power and victory of Jesus' life. It's right there in John chapter 5. He said this, I only do, say only. only. I only do what I see my Father do. Therefore, we should be saying every day, Lord, give me eyes that see, really see, that really see. Can I see beyond my own experience, my own daily stuff to really see what you're doing. And then he said, I only say what I hear my father say. Ugh. And so he could say, not winking, no tongue in cheek. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen my father. That cuts me to the core. Because I realize that with the investment that God's made in me, I'll say in us, first of all, we're created in his image. Page two of our Bibles. Right? Picked up a hunk of clay and went, Face to face, nose to nose, mouth to mouth, as the prophet laid on top of that little boy. He did that for you and me. Because outside of him, there is no life. He is life. He's the source. And so that's, that's page two. And then... We have, what, Romans 8, that that same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead has now taken up residence inside of us. Inside of us. Not that we have to reach outside and say, please come to me. I think a lot of us, we have to get over ourselves and just simply deep, speaking to deep. Do, do we believe that he does live inside of us? Does, has he taken up residence inside of us? Have we died with him, been raised from? We were, we're just singing what we believe here. 
And then if that weren't enough, in John 17, Yeshua, Jesus, prays for us. First, he prays for himself because of what about he's just about to undergo in order to make a way for us where there seems to be no way. Thank you, Don Moen. Put it in a song. <laughs> Whether you're Jew or Gentile, we all need to come in the same narrow gate. We all have to be stripped of all of that stuff and get through that little gate. There's, there's no DNA test at the door. Whosoever will, whoever is willing to take off all that stuff, get on your face and go through that little narrow door, y'all come. So he prayed for himself, then he prayed for his disciples, and then he prayed for us, and he prayed that we would be one. But right after he prays, may they be one, he says this, Father, I have given them, speaking of you and me, listen to this, the same kvod, the same glory, say the same, same. the same glory. same glory. I have given to them, have given, past tense, because in him there's no, it all, he sees it all. <laughs> Part of the mystery. I don't know if Jonathan Kahn explained that mystery to you. He's the mystery man these days. <laughs> I knew him before he was the mystery man. I knew him before his beard reached the bottom of his eyes. <laughs> but he's a dear friend. I have given them the same glory that you gave me. Created in his image, same spirit that raised Yeshua from the dead now takes up residence in us, and the same glory, kvod, which is the manifest weight of his presence. So therefore, I should be able to say, I hope you're sitting down. If you've seen me, you've seen my Messiah. Because I was created in his image. The same spirit that raised him from the dead has now taken up residence in me. And that same manifest presence of God that was on in him, he has now given to me. Wow, quite a, quite an investment, wouldn't you say? So I like to say that in, in worship, there's no experts. There's no experts, we're just, we're just coming before a throne, before a king. I, I appreciate the worship that I was a part of here for these few minutes this morning. I led, I led worship in a conference a couple months ago, and the speaker was a well-known pastor from an inner city church. I won't tell you what city. It was a very large church, 30,000 people. Inner city pastors, African-American and after I got finished leading worship, I was really curious about, you know, did that, did that speak into him? Was he able to participate? Was this something that reached into his experience and maybe cleared out the atmosphere so he can hear the voice of God? I think that's a big part of being a worship leader, part of a worship team. And when he got up to the microphone, the place was dark, the lights came down, the bright lights came on him. And he's, he said, Paul, I hadn't met him before. He said, where are you? <laughs> you know that apprehension of what's he going to say? And he came right down the front apron of the platform. He said, thank you so much 
for not leading us in Jesus is my boyfriend songs. Jesus is my boyfriend songs. Which I took him to mean maybe kind of an earmark of a generation. But when we come before a king, there's a posture. When we come before a king, there's an attitude. We never come empty-handed. But we come having taken everything off so that we can bow low and get through that little narrow door which leads to a big, wide open space. That was my hello, how are you doing part. <laughs> but I, I can't help but you, you've provoked me already. So now you're in for it. You provoked me. Do you have your Bibles? See if you can find the book of Proverbs in chapter 22 for a moment. I kind of got I kind of got stuck with these prayer requests earlier. Pray for my granddaughters. Rare diseases. Pray for our son, Crohn's disease. Dear Pat, Please pray for my eyes, diagnosed, going blind. Jesus was moved by compassion for the hurting. These disasters that we're seeing, for some people losing everything, their homes, their possessions, and some even their lives. What a great opportunity for the church. What a great opportunity for us to display the compassion of God so that we're not known as just those people that inhabit that little building over there on, on that part of town, but that we're known as an extension of heaven into our communities. And I've really been, I've been encouraged to see the churches of of Houston kind of rise up and be very vocal and even on television send us the resources so that we can reach out with it. And now the churches of Florida, I'm a Floridian, uh, but we never lost power at our house. We, we didn't have any water damage. We had no wind damage. But we're some of those weird people in your neighborhood that go out into the driveway and speak to the clouds. <laughs> I, I thought last year during whatever hurricane that was, I can't remember, there's so many of them now, when, when our neighborhood, the whole neighborhood, never lost power, no damage, no, no, none of that stuff. I think it was a two or three by the time it got to us. And I looked at the map when that hurricane last fall was coming right up the coast of Florida and it got about 20 miles from Jacksonville and went, out to sea. And there we were, my wife and my son, my daughter and our pets. We've taught our pets how to speak to the... <laughs> Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. <laughs> and we're out in our driveway and calling that thing by name and telling it where to go. And the same thing we... I think when I'm home next week, I'm going door to door. I'm going to take an offering basket and say, you're welcome. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 22. Look at verse 28. Do not move an ancient boundary stone set up 
by your forefathers. Do not move an ancient boundary stone set up by your forefathers. Now, there's obviously natural explanations and applications, but I think even more, there are deeper spiritual applications, interpretations, if you will, for this word. And I have in the past been concerned about the United States of America for us as a nation, us as a people. Because over the course of my few years on this little blue planet, I've, I've watched people put their shoulder to some of these ancient boundary stones and, and begin to move them or change the name of them. I believe there are, there are two pillars that sustain us as a society, as a culture. One of those is that we have been a God-fearing Judeo-Christian culture. And now it's being violently challenged on college campuses. You know, the Ivy League schools were initially established as Bible schools. Did you know that in days gone by, fraternities, college fraternities, were fraternity, they were groups of, of Christian men who got together and prayed and studied scriptures. That they weren't known as party places or places of rebellion. But some of these ancient stones, the other pillar that holds up the porch, that props up the porch of the United States of America, and I believe holds back the judgment of God, is that we have historically been a nation, a people who stand with, support the nation of Israel and the Jewish people. I th the key to success in life is love what God loves and hate what he hates. So let me give you three words. Three words. Align, restore, advance. Three words out of the oven this morning. Align, restore, and advance. And it came to me like this. If you will align with my plans and purposes and design for your life, then I will restore to you all the things that have been lost, stolen, sold, given away. Because the enemy only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And then we together will advance into the glorious future that I have prepared for you. For I know the thoughts and the plans that I have for you, says the Lord, to give you a future and a hope. At different times in my life, I've had the privilege of pastoring in local congregations, one in a Messianic congregation back in Rockville, Maryland. You, you might know the name Sid Roth. He was one of the founding fathers of, now he's Mr. It's Supernatural. <laughs> and Dan Jester and Eitan Shishkoff and some of these other names that may mean nothing to you, but they were pioneers. They're now in their 70s and maybe close to 80, pioneers of the modern Messianic Jewish revolution, revival. And I was privileged to be worship leader there, cantor, uh, spirit-filled, Holy Ghost cantor in a Messianic congregation, and then later on in a big independent charismatic church in Chicago. And the one question, probably as a pastor and doing a lot of counseling, that always came is, what is God saying to me? And it always used to make me marvel. Why would you come to me and ask me, what is God saying to you? I see as our primary goal, job number one, is to know God and then make him known. But if we don't even know God well enough to hear what he's saying to us, 
Give and it'll be given to you. Press down, shaken together, running over. I know most people use that during offering time. But I think it goes a lot deeper than our pockets. Because you can't give what you don't have. And as we have people of compassion who say what we hear him say and do what we see him do, I can't give what I don't have. It, re it reminds me of the disciple who came to Jesus and said, look, um, Lord, these people have been here a long time. He's speaking out of compassion. Uh, it's, it's late. They haven't had anything to eat. And he's expecting Jesus to come up with the goods, right? But Jesus looks at him and says, you feed them. He did the kosher crab walk at that point. <laughs> Is there a kosher crab? Because I don't go there. <laughs> you can't give what you don't have. So if you will align with me, I will restore, and then we can advance into the glorious future that I've prepared for you, said the Lord to me. So I deliver that to you today. What does it mean to align? What does it mean to align? There's a, when you're building a building, there is a line that goes up, a plumb line, so that everything will be square and even, so that you won't get to putting up the walls or, God forbid, the roof, and it's sitting this way or that way or that way. Everything has to be in alignment, which means that the foundation has to be solid and firm. Anytime you see a corporate structure, there's one guy at the top, and then it comes down to these two, and it divides into four more, and eight more over here, and 16 over here, and, but it all is relating to that guy at the top, and you would think that's how the kingdom is established. No, the Bible says that the kingdom of God is established on a foundation, not from a suspended ceiling, it's built on the foundation of the prophets and the apostles, and it builds up from a solid foundation. And so I want to encourage you in these days while you're here, keep going back and checking the foundation. Make sure that it's good and solid, that the plumb line is solid. If you will align with me, my plans and purposes. Now, the Lord has spoken to me very personally about some things that I'm not going to tell you about because it's none of your business. <laughs> about areas in my life that need to get realigned. Things I used to do that because I'm too busy, I don't do anymore. And so on and so forth. And don't ask me about it because I won't tell you. But I've laid it all out in front of him and said, Lord, where am I out of alignment? Because at my young age, I've got still a lot of gas in the tank, and I am expecting in this new season, I mean, to hit it harder than ever. We are repositioning. We're making alignments and uh, partnerships with other people as, as the Lord shows us and other ministries to do something in the earth that only he can do. If it's not bigger than you, why would you bother doing it anyway? If you can accomplish your dreams in your own strength, I'll tell you this, it's not God. Those are not dreams, those are nightmares. And they'll come back to haunt you because you're the one who originated, you have to fund it, you have to keep it going. You have to redo the plumbing. You have to, do the, you have to do it all because it all depended on you. If you will align with me, who am I? Speak to me. Write this chapter down. 1 John chapter 2, verse 20 through 27. Meditate on that a little bit later on today. I love that seven verses. 1 John chapter 2, verse 20 to 27. See what he says to you out of that. 
If you'll align with me, body, soul, and spirit, then I will restore. You know, we're funny, we're funny creatures, aren't we? We like to play leapfrog. We hear a message on restoration, and man, I am there. God, restore me. Here's the broken thing. Here's the thing I've sold off that I shouldn't. Here's my inheritance that I foolishly left with the pigs in that pen. You know, the, you know, the, that guy. And, and here's the stuff. I want to be restored. Restore me, Lord. Restore me. And for 15 years, restore, restore, re, re, oh, well. Maybe restoration's not for me. Or we hear a, a great message from some, advance, here's it, put on the full armor. Da, da, da. It's Rosh Hashanah. You'll hear it tonight. <laughs> Better than that. And so we, we run after the message. But what the Lord just said to me is, you got to, Take the first step. I want you to realign. Alignment is the word of the day for me. Align. Body, soul, spirit. Do you know Dr. Michael Brown? He's, he's on this thing about breaking, breaking the, the, um, the habit, breaking addiction, breaking the addiction of food. He's one of my dear friends, but he is like a bull in a china shop. He gets a word and he preaches it to the whole world with passion and fire and you figure I should never eat again. <laughs> so I've taken a small piece of his preaching and applied it to my life. So I'm 20 pounds lighter than I was last year. I'm on my way. But I have to confess to you this morning that that blueberry muffin in the green room <laughs> looked so delicious that the banana just didn't do it. <laughs> All right, so I've confessed my sin to you. Forgive me. But I'm also not preaching that you're addicted to food either, so that's Mike Brown's deal. But he's shown me things that I need to do with, with my body. I'm back to the, I'm back to the gym and I'm, I'm pumping iron and, and God help me, I'm doing squats, which helps me when I'm running from one plane to the next. I can actually get there before I die. <laughs> it's good. It's really good. Because the future he's shown me is so much better than the past, I have got to get this, this temple in line in order to be fit for the future. Simple. I hope it doesn't mean that I'm just going to be running for more planes. If you'll align, let me tell you about restore. Restore means to return something, something to its original place, purpose, or destiny. Restore. To return something to its original place, purpose, or destiny. And to return someone to their original place, plan, purpose, or destiny. So he said, look, align. Get things in alignment. Line up. Discipline your flesh. Take captive the thoughts. Get your soul in line. Spend more time with me. You become like the one that you spend time with. Not Fox News. Then I will restore all that you've lost, it's been stolen, that you've sold given away. And in that place of being restored and refined, now we can advance into the glorious future that I have prepared for you, says the Lord. 
created in his image. Same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. And the same glory. You know, the thing that I love about worship like Abraham and Isaac. When we come to a place of such love and trust that we're willing to do whatever he says. Whatever we've been trusting in. Whatever we have put our hopes in outside of who he is. If the world gave it to us, the world can take it away. We come to that place where all that matters to us is to say, but not my will, your will be done. Jesus kneeling and bleeding in the garden is the perfect picture of worship. You remember that that was on the same hill that Abraham and Isaac offered themselves completely. Same mountain. Same mountain. Until we come to that mountain and we're willing to just lay it all down, all my hopes and dreams and aspirations and visions and to realign. Abba, what are you saying? You're a good, good father. It's not just a good song. It's a declaration of who he is. And when we believe him and we come to that place where we kneel at that rock, All that matters is what do you think? He says, then I'll restore you. Remember what happened with Job? He got double. Double the stuff. Because he refused to give up, curse God and die. And then he got to counsel his friends who thought, man, you must be a terrible sinner. Look at the trouble. I'd like to offer this to you today. If you're saying, I know there's areas of my life that need to be realigned. And I'm making a commitment right now to hear him and to line those things up by his grace. Some things need to come off. Other things need to be added. Whatever it is. Because I know that there is a glorious future for me. And I'm committed to being the person that God has breathed his life into me to be. If that's you today, I invite you to stand and we're just going to pray together. Would you just offer your hands up before the Lord and surrender? And follow me in this, in this prayer if you can. Father God, here I am. You know me. And you love me. 
And I confess to you that I love you. Here's my life. Show me any area that's out of line. I submit it to you now. And I promise, by your grace, what you show me, I will do. Give me your eyes and your ears so that like Jesus, I can do what you do and say what you say. I lay my life down again. Would you take it up and give it back to me in a way that pleases you? I surrender all my hopes and dreams. I submit them to you that they would go through the filter of your love. That I would be a worshiper in spirit and in truth. Father, I say to you, not my will, but your will be done. And may you be pleased. This is my prayer and my heart today that you mold me and fashion me into your image and your likeness. And may I hear those precious words. Well done, good and faithful servant. This is my desire that you be glorified. Father, I pray for my friends. May we all align. Come to that place of unity and love. That we can fulfill the commandment to love you with all of our heart, soul, strength, and might. And to love our neighbor as ourself. Not a suggestion, but yes, a commandment. And Lord, we're willing to take off all the stuff to go through that little door that in our weakness, you would be seen as great. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. Yivarechacha Adonai v'yishmarecha. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Ya'er Adonai panevelecha v'chuneka. May the Lord lift up his countenance, the brightness of his face upon you, and give you his peace. Yisa Adonai panevelecha v'yasamlecha. Shalom. B'shem Yeshua HaMashiach, Sar Shalom, in the name of Jesus, our Messiah, the Prince of all peace. Amen and amen. Amen. God bless you. We take life.
you just this is like new career.